Hi guys! Welcome back on what is our second of what will be our continuing series on our boy Beowulf. Uh, when we left off, Beowulf had heard the tales of the terror that Grendel had been causing in Hrothgar's kingdom. And Beowulf got together a whole bunch of his strongest, best, bravest guys and sailed over to the Danish kingdom that Hrothgar is ruling, determined to help. Okay, and Beowulf is the bestest, most strongest, most wonderful everything. When he shows up, and obviously we're reading segments here, so we're kind of jumping. Um, when he shows up, he's initially greeted by the guards at the, uh, at the coast as an invading enemy. But he says who he is, and he sends word to Hrothgar. And he's escorted to the Mead Hall. And we're picking up with the text just as Beowulf and his guys arrive at the Mead Hall and they're greeted by another guard who has heard the message that they're coming, has talked to the king, and it has a message back for them. Okay, so if you open up your Word document, scroll down to where it says the arrival of the hero. Uh, it's about line 125. Okay, and that's where we're going to pick up. You ready? Then Wolfgar, who's the guard at the Mead Hall, went to the door and addressed the waiting seafarers. Hey, seafarers, like that poem? With soldiers' words. My lord, the great king of the Danes commands me to tell you that he knows of your noble birth, and that having come to him from over the open sea, you have come bravely and are welcome. Now, go to him as you are, in your armor and helmets, but leave your battle shields here and your spears. Let them lie waiting for the promises your words may make. Okay, so two things there, right? One, you, uh, although you're welcome, you can't just walk into the king's chamber armed. So leave your, leave your arms here, leave your weapons here. But also, those weapons are going to be how you keep your promise that you're going to get rid of Grendel. Beowulf arose with his men around him, ordering a few to remain with their weapons. Right, because Beowulf's no fool and he's going to have backup, just in case. Uh, leading the others quickly along under Herat's steep roof. Remember, Herat is the name of the Mead Hall. Into Hrothgar's presence. Standing on that prince's own hearth. Okay, the word hearth means the place in front of a fireplace. So like where it's warm and usually it's like stones or something, um, not carpet. So he's, you know, he's right in the prince's presence. Helmeted. The silvery metal of his mail shirt gleaming with a smith's high art. So he's got really awesome armor. He greeted the Dane's great lord. Hail Hrothgar. Higlock is my cousin and my king. The days of my youth have been filled with glory. Now Grendel's name has echoed in our land. Sailors have bought up, brought us stories of Herat, the best of all mead halls, deserted and useless until the moon hangs in skies the sun had lit, light and life fleeting together. So he does a good introduction, right? He tells who he is. He hails the king. He tells how he's connected to his lord. Right? So Higlock is his cousin and his, his king. And says, I've heard about your problem and I'm here to help. And, did you get it? Did you notice? He praised the Mead Hall as being the best ever. Always good to butter up the king. Right? Okay, scroll down. My people have said, the wisest and most knowing and best of them, that my duty was to go to the Danes' great king. They've seen my strength for themselves, have watched me rise from the darkness of war, dripping with my enemy's blood. Well, there, there's a metal uh, record cover for you, right? I drove five great giants in chains, chased all that race from the earth. I swam in the blackness of night, hunting monsters out of the ocean, killing them one by one. Death was my errand and the fate they had earned. Now, Grendel and I are called together, and I've come. Grant me then, Lord and protector of this noble place, a single request. 
I have come so far, O shelterer of warriors, and your people's loved friend, that this one favor you should not refuse me, that I, alone and with the help of my men, may purge all evil from this hall. I have heard, too, that the monster's scorn of men is so great that he needs no weapons and fears none, nor will I. My Lord Hicklock might think less of me if I let my sword go where my feet were afraid to, if I hid behind some broad linden shield. My hands alone shall fight for me, struggle for life against the monster. God must decide who will be given to death's cold grip. Okay. Dude knows how to boast. He's basically come with like his resume, right? Here's why you should let me fight your monster. I've done this. I've done that. I've beat these monsters. I've killed sea monsters, blah, blah, blah. I'm your guy. Hire me, right? And then even before the king says anything, he's like, oh, and by the way, I've come a long way. So I've got one request. And actually, he has two requests, but the one request is, hey, Hrothgar, let me and my boys deal with this, right? Your warriors have had their chance. I need you guys to back, you know, back off and let my, me and my guys handle this. Oh, and while we're at it, since Grendel uses no weapons, right, because Grendel's so big, he just grabs 30 fools. Since Grendel uses no weapons, neither will I. And since Grendel, Grendel uses no armor, neither will I. Because, you know, my lord would think worse of me if I fought something that didn't use a weapon, and I did. That's not fair. Right? Okay. So, he's asking Hrothgar, let me and my guys handle this. I'm going to use no weapons, and I'm not going to wear any armor. God's going to decide this. Now, if you were the king and Grendel had been terrorizing your country for years, are you going to agree with this? This guy turning up out of the blue? Okay, let's jump down here uh, to where it says Grendel's plan. Grendel's plan, I think, this is still Beowulf talking, Grendel's plan, I think, will be what it has been before, to invade this hall and gorge his belly with our bodies. If he can, if he can, and I think if my time will have come, there'll be nothing to mourn over, no corpse to prepare for its grave. Grendel will carry our bloody flesh to the moors, crunch on our bones, and smear torn scraps of our skin on the walls of his den. No, I expect no Danes will fret over so in our shrouds. If he wins, and if death takes me. Send the hammered mail of my armor to Higlock. Return the inheritance I had from Hrethel, and he from Wayland. Fate must unwind as it will. Okay, so Beowulf's like, listen, if I die, there's, and if we die, there's not going to be corpses. You're not going to need a funeral. Just send my stuff back to my lord. Fate will decide this. But you notice there's a lot of if there, right? Like, if this happens. Okay, jumping down to 190. Hrothgar replied, protector of the Danes, Beowulf, you've come to us in friendship, and because of the reception your father found at our court, Edgthau had become a bitter feud, killing Halfleth, a Hulfling warrior. Your father's countrymen were afraid of war. If he returned to his home, and they turned him away. So, we're getting backstory on Beowulf's dad here. Remember, the, this has like drive-by exposition, and they kind of expect the audience to probably know these backstories, so they're not giving us a whole lot here. But basically, Hrothgar's like, hey, Beowulf, you're welcome at my court. I know who you are. I know who your dad is, and I know what his story is. And he came to my court because his own country turned him away. They were afraid of him. Because other people were mad at him, and his country thought that if they took him back, he, that would cause a war. So they kicked him out, and um, so he came to me. 
Then he traveled across the curving waves to the land of the Danes. I was new to the throne, then a young man ruling this wide kingdom and its golden city. Hirgar, my older brother, a far better man than I, had died, and dying made me second among Helfdane's sons, first in this nation. So his brother was king, his brother died, um, or, or his father was king, but his older brother died before he could be king, so that's how Hrothgar got the throne. I bought the edge of I bought the end of Edgethrow's quarrel, sent ancient treasures across the ocean's furrows to the Welflings. Your father swore he'd keep that peace. Okay, remember back when we talked about, like, blood money and blood price in the last section? So the whole, like, I bought the peace is because Hrothgar paid the blood money that Beowulf's father, for whatever it was he did that caused the problem, so Hrothgar paid him off, paid off the people that were mad at Beowulf's dad. And as a result, Beowulf's dad owes loyalty to Hrothgar. Okay, none of this really matters all that much, except that Beowulf and Hrothgar are like, they know each other of old and their families have loyalty to each other. Okay. My tongue grows heavy and my heart when I try to tell you what Grendel has brought us, the damage he's done here in this hall. You see for yourself how much smaller our ranks have become, and you can guess what we've lost to his terror. Surely the Lord Almighty will stop his madness, smother his lust. How many times have my men, glowing with courage drawn from too many cups of ale, sworn to stay after dark and stem that horror with a sweep of their swords, and then, in the morning, this mead hall glittering with new light would be drenched with blood, the benches stained red, the floors all wet from that fiend's savage assault, and my soldiers would be fewer, still death taking more and more. Okay. So he's like, Beowulf, you don't even know. You don't even know. How many times my guys have gotten drunk and said they're going to stay up all night and fight Grendel when he shows up, and then in the morning there's blood everywhere and more people are dead. But to table, Beowulf, a banquet in your honor. Let us toast your victories and talk of the future. Okay, so they're all going to go eat and drink and have a good time. Then Hrothgar's men gave places to the Geats, yielded benches to the brave visitors, and led them to the feast. So they're all eating together in the great hall, finally, after, you know, after as long as it's been. The keeper of the mead came carrying out the carved flasks and poured that bright sweetness. So that's their alcoholic drink, right? A poet sang from time to time in a clear, pure voice. Danes and visiting Geats celebrated as one and drank and rejoiced. Okay, so ain't no party like a Hrothgar party, right? Because a Hrothgar party only ends when Grendel eats you all. All right, now, I know you've experienced this, right? You are really, like, you're getting ready to do something, yeah? And someone speaks up and starts talking about some rumor they heard about you, right? Or, you you know, maybe you've bragged about something on social media, and up in the comments, some pip squeaks, like, yeah, but I heard blah, 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 blah. Hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so guess what? That's not new either. Our, our boy Beowulf is about to get a challenge from Unferth. Now, Unferth is one of Hrothgar's guys who's, you know, one of his warriors, um, and they're all partying together, right? But imagine if you were one of these warriors, yeah? And, s and you've been fighting Grendel for years, and your guys keep dying. And suddenly, out of the blue, some other guy shows up and says, and brags, and is like, I'm going to kill him without any weapons. You'd be pretty mad, too, right? Okay, so Unferth is mostly jealous. Okay, we're going to skip down to Unferth's challenge. You ready? Unferth spoke, Igloth's son. Okay, remember, they always tell us, like, who their daddy is. Igloth's son, 
who sat at Hrothgar's feet. Okay, so if you're sitting at the king's feet, you're pretty important, right? That's kind of a place of honor. Spoke harshly and sharp, vexed by Beowulf's adventure by their visitor's courage, and angry that anyone in Denmark or anywhere in the world had ever acquired glory and fame greater than his own. Oh, you know that guy, right? Or that girl? You definitely know them. Where they can't stand that anybody did something that they didn't do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's Unferth. Your Beowulf, are you the same boastful fool who fought a swimming match with Brekka? Both of you daring and young and proud, exploring the deepest seas, risking your lives for no reason but the danger? All older and wiser heads warned you not to, but no one could check such pride. With Brekka at your side, you swam along the sea paths, your swift moving hands pulling you over the ocean water, ocean's face. Then winter churned through the water, the waves ran you as they will, and you struggled seven long nights to survive. And at the end, victory was his, not yours. The sea carried him close to his home to southern Norway, near the land of the Brondings, where he ruled and was loved, where his treasure was piled and his strength protected his towns and his people. He would promised to outswim you, Bronston's son, made that boast ring true. You've been lucky in your battles, Beowulf, but I think your luck may change if you challenge Grendel. Staying the whole night, through in this hall, waiting where that fiercest of demons can find you? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. Unfurts that guy. But think about this, right? How's Beowulf going to answer that? Is he just going to say, well, I can do it? No. Listen. And he can't, like, just say, Unferth, you're a dork. Shut up. Because he's sitting at the king's feet. Obviously, the king cares about this guy, right? Okay. So he's got to, like, walk that line. Beowulf answered Edgethrow's great son. Ah, Unferth, my friend, your face is hot with ale, and your tongue has tried to tell us about Brekka's doings. But the truth is simple. So he's basically, like, saying, you're drunk, my friend, and you tried, but you didn't get all the details right. But the truth is simple. No man swims in the sea as I can. No strength is a match for mine. As boys, Breck and I had boasted, we were both too young to know better, that we'd risk our lives far out at sea, and so we did. Each of us carried a naked sword. Okay, so a sword without a sheath, without something around it. Prepared for whales or the swift, sharp teeth and beaks of needlefish. He would never leave me behind, swim faster across the waves than I could, and I'd chosen to remain close to his side. So well, uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't swim faster than me, and I chose to hold myself back and stay near him. I remained near him for five long nights until a flood swept us apart. The frozen sea surged around me. It grew dark. The wind grew bitter, blowing from the north, and the waves were savage. Creatures who sleep deep in the sea were stirred into life and the iron hammered links of my mail shirt, these shining bits of metal woven across my breast, saved me from death. A monster seized me, drew me swiftly toward the bottom, swimming with its claws tight in my flesh. But fate let me find its heart with my sword. Hack myself free. I fought that beast's last battle, left it floating lifeless in the sea. Other monsters crowded around me, continually attacking. I treated them politely, offering the edge of my razor-sharp sword. But the feast, I think, did not please them. Filled their evil bellies with no banquet-rich food. Thrashing there at the bottom of the sea, by morning they decided to sleep on the shore. Lying on their backs, their blood spilled out on the sand. <laughs> okay, so he's like, oh no, I invited to them to a banquet of my sword. And uh, they didn't like it very much, so uh, they decided not to eat my banquet, but instead to go lay on the beach and be dead. <laughs> Afterwards, sailors could cross that sea road and feel no fear, so he dealt with all the monsters in that sea and no one else has to deal with them anymore. Nothing would stop their passing. 
Then God's bright beacon appeared in the east. Well, if it's in the east, right? It's the sun. The water lay still, and at last I could see the land. Wind swept, cliff walls at the edge of the coast. Fate saves the living when they drive away death by themselves. Lucky or not, nine was the number of huge sea-huge sea monsters I killed. What man anywhere under heaven's high arch has fought in such darkness, endured such misery, or been harder pressed? Yet I survived the sea, smashed the monster's hot jaws, swam home from my journey, the swift flowing water swept me along, and I landed on Finnish soil. I've heard no tales of you, Unferth, telling of such clashing terror, such contests in the night. Breca's battles were never so bold. Neither he nor you can match me, and I mean no boast. I've announced no more than I know to be true. Okay, so we hear Beowulf's version of this battle with the sea monsters. And he's like, yeah, you're right. I didn't win the swimming race because I killed nine sea monsters by myself. And then, yeah, I landed, you know, slightly late, but it's fine. And even Breca didn't fight those battles. And then, wait for it, right? He's not just going to brag on himself. He's going to take Unferth down a peg. Because he's got some dirt. He's got some tea on Unferth. You ready? Here he goes. Uh, line 320. And, what's, and there's more. You murdered your brothers, your own close kin. Words and bright wit won't help your soul. You'll suffer hell's fires unferth, forever tormented. Iglaf's proud son, if your hands were as hard, your heart as fierce as you think it, no fool would dare to raid your hall, ruin Herat and impress its prince as Grendel has done. It's like unferth, you killed your brothers and you're gonna rot in hell for it. Oh, and by the way, if you were as bad a warrior as you think you are, Grendel wouldn't dare come around here and, and ruin the hall and, and kill all the warriors and annoy your prince, but uh, you kind of suck, so shut up. But he's learned, he being Grendel, he's learned that terror is his alone, discovered he can come for your people with no fear of reprisal. He's found no fighting here, but only food, only delight. He murders as he likes, and with no mercy, gorges and feasts on your flesh and expects no trouble, no quarrel from the quiet Danes. Now the Geats will show him some courage. Soon he can test his strength in battle, and when the sun comes up again, opening another bright day from the south, everyone in Denmark may enter this hall. That evil will be gone. Okay, so we have the parallelism, right, of him killing all the sea monsters and then the, sa the sea is safe for people to travel. And here he says, I'm going to kill Grendel, and then this hall will be safe for anybody who wants to come here. Now, imagine you are the king, right, and the guy who's sitting at your feet just got told off so bad. Hrothgar, gray-haired and brave, sat happily listening so he is quite the little drama queen here, Hrothgar is. The famous ring giver, sure at last Grendel could be killed. He believed in Beowulf's bold strength and firmness of spirit. There was a sound of laughter and of cheerful clanking of cups and pleasant words. Then Welthro, Hrothgar's gold-ringed queen, greeted the warriors, a noble woman who knew what was right. She raised a flowing cup to Hrothgar first, right, because you always toast the king first, holding it high for the Lord of the Danes to drink, wishing him joy in that feast. So she literally brings the cup to the king and gives it to him to drink, right? A little bit like communion, maybe? You know, um, the famous king drank with pleasure and blessed their banquet. Then Welth Welthro, went from warrior to warrior, portioning a, pouring a portion from the jeweled cup for each, till the bracelet-wearing queen had carried the mead cup among them, and it was Beowulf's turn to be served. She saluted the Geat's great prince, thanked God for answering her prayers, and allowing her hands the happy duty of offering mead to a hero who would help her afflicted people. 
He drank what she poured, Edgethro's brave son, and then assured the Danish queen his heart was firm and his hands were ready. Okay, so this is Beowulf talking to the queen. She's taken the drink all around. She's like honoring him, right? And he's talking to her. When we crossed the sea, my comrades and I, I already knew that all my purpose was this, to win the goodwill of your people or die in battle, pressed in Grendel's fierce grip. Let me live in greatness and in courage, or here in this hall, welcome my death. Wellthrow was pleased with his words, his bright-tongued boasts. She carried them back to her lord, walked nobly across to his side. Okay, remember, because this is a huge meat hall, the king wouldn't necessarily have heard what Beowulf just told her, so she goes back to the king and tells him what Beowulf said. Then Hrothgar rose, Healthdane's son, heavy with sleep. So they've partied all night, and now it's, you know, it's getting really late, and he's tired. As soon as the sun had gone, he knew that Grendel would come to Herat, would visit that hall when night had covered the earth with its net, and the shapes of darkness moved black and silent through the world. Hrothgar's warriors rose with him. So all of Hrothgar and all of his men stand up. Okay, and I said before it was getting late. Well, it's getting dark. He went to Beowulf, embraced the Geat's brave prince, wished him well, and hoped that Herat would be his to command. And then he declared, No one strange to this land has ever been granted what I'm giving you. No one in all the years of my rule. Make this the best of all mead halls yours. And then keep it free from evil. Fight with glory in your heart. Purge Herat, and your ship will sail home with its treasure holds full. Okay, and that's where we're going to leave it for today. We're coming up to the battle. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to go into um, Schoology. You're going to make your notes in the same note document that we used last time. And um, you're going to answer your discussion questions and keep going with your activities. Okay, and next time we will do the battle with Grendel. Bye, everybody.